Hello again everyone, and today I have something nice and new to present to you, the Sigma 65mm f2 DG DNC for Contemporary. This is part of a new line that Sigma are introducing, which will be known as their i-series lenses, and the idea is that they'll be a lot like their more expensive art lenses in terms of build quality and image quality, but smaller, and with a modestly darker maximum aperture and, as you can see, a very distinctive external design. In some ways, the build quality of this lens is even nicer than Sigma's art lenses. Well, we'll look at that a bit more in a minute. It'll be available for Sony E-mount cameras, as well as L-mount cameras, and will cost about £650 in the UK, so I imagine that'll be about $700 or so in the US, so it's clearly not intended to be a cheap and cheerful product. I'd like to thank Sigma for letting me borrow an early copy of this lens for testing, although as usual, this is a totally independent review. 65mm is a rather unusual focal length for a prime lens, although it's quite a pleasant one in use. It's just about the shortest telephoto angle you can get, and while I was out shooting with it, I just thought of it as a 50mm lens with a bit more oomph. It's most at home with subject photography though, and its reasonably bright maximum aperture of f2 means that it'll happily give you some very nice portrait pictures as well. On an APS-C camera, its field of view will look even tighter of course. An aperture as bright as f2 will also help you to shoot in darker situations. Let's get stuck in and look at this lens's build quality first, which is what leaps out at you the moment you hold it in your hand. It's difficult for me to convey to you just how beautiful this lens is to handle, and how high quality just about everything about it feels. It's very solid, very tightly assembled, and very metallic, with a nice mixture of brushed metal and hairline processed finishing, which feels amazing and looks pretty cool too. What do you think of its design aesthetic? It's modelled after cinema lenses, as you might have guessed, but still designed with still photographers in mind. It certainly makes a bold statement, whatever they were aiming for. There is a thin weather sealing gasket around the rear lens mount, and Sigma claimed that the lens is designed to be dust and splash resistant. Next comes the aperture ring. It turns with lovely, positive clicks, particularly if you turn it to auto mode, so you're not likely to accidentally change your aperture here. This time, there's no option to make that aperture ring turn smoothly, it will only work with clicks. Then you get a manual focus ring, which turns extremely smoothly, and it works very responsively with the lens's focus motor. You can switch the lens from auto to manual focus with a very positive, arc-shaped focus switch towards the rear of the lens. Manually focusing the lens is precise and responsive. However, we see a lot of focus breathing here, which might be a little troublesome for filmmakers. Now let's take a look at the lens's autofocus. It's reasonably quick, accurate, and silent in use. It did hunt a little bit, occasionally, but that's probably more the result of my using it on a slightly older Sony camera here, so an a7R 3 camera or upwards will probably be a bit more confident. The lens comes with a conventional, standard lens cap that clips on as normal, as you can see, but it also comes with something else, very unusual, a magnetic lens cap that attaches itself right onto the front. Sigma are really thinking out of the box there. A magnetic lens cap holder will be available separately, which you can attach to your camera bag or somewhere about your person. That could be an interesting solution for some people. We'll have to see if that idea takes off. It also comes with a very high quality metallic lens hood. Its filter thread size is 62mm wide, and it does not have image stabilisation. Overall, this line of Sigma lenses possibly have some of the highest build quality of any autofocus lens that I've ever handled. This is how I wish my Canon L lenses were built. Anyway, enough of that, let's look at a more important image quality. Firstly, I'll be testing the lens on a full frame camera, my 42 megapixel Sony a7R II. In the middle of the image, picture quality is essentially perfect, extremely high resolution, very high contrast, and zero colour fringing. Let's look over into the corners. There's just the tiniest imaginable reduction in quality here, but still, the lens remains brilliantly sharp, with high contrast, no colour fringing, and the corners are fairly bright too. Stop down to f2.8, and that edge of perfection reappears. It doesn't get any better than this. 
It's taste is sharp down to F11. If you use top down to F16 or F22, then some softness emerges due to the effects of diffraction. Overall though, on a full frame camera, it really is an astonishing performance here. The lens is making mincemeat out of what is actually a very high resolution camera sensor. Alright, let's attach it to an APS-C camera, my 24 megapixel Sony A5100. In the middle of the image, straight from f2, the lens continues to be razor sharp in the middle. Over in the corners, well, it's the same, brilliant. Although again, if you stop down to f2.8, a tiny extra edge of resolution does kick in there, elevating it to perfection. This time, the lens starts getting a little softer if you stop down to f11, and at f16, diffraction is really kicking in now, as you would expect. Again though, it's more than a clean bill of health on an APS-C camera, the lens is essentially perfect here. Now, let's take a look at distortion and vignetting on a full frame camera. If you keep the in-camera corrections turned on, then they won't be a problem. Turn them off, and the lens projects some strong pincushion distortion, but only moderate vignetting at f2. Stop down to f2.8, and that vignetting clears up. So, keep those corrections turned on, well, the distortion correction, at least. This lens can focus as closely as 55 centimeters to your subject, which is reasonably good for getting pictures of smaller objects. The close-up image quality is a bit softer at f2. f2.8 is much sharper though, and f4 looks great again. Let's take a look at the lens's work against bright lights. It's a pretty good show here too. Flaring and glaring aren't particularly strong, which contributes to the lens's very high contrast. And now, let's take a look at the lens's bokeh, an important question for one of this kind. It's not quite the softest bokeh I've ever seen in my life, but those backgrounds certainly do look nice and smooth. I couldn't see any serious problems in any of my sample pictures, so again, that's very nice. And finally, longitudinal chromatic aberration. At the brightest aperture of f2, it's pretty strong here, showing blue and yellow colour fringing on bokeh highlights. That sticks around at f2.8, but at f4, it's mostly gone. All things considered, I'm quite a big admirer of this new lens from Sigma, both its concept and its quality are very attractive. It's on the pricey side, but its optics really are excellent. The only flies in the ointment are some high distortion and noticeable longitudinal chromatic aberration, which hardly distract from the lens's excellent sharpness, contrast, smooth bokeh, and exceptionally polished build quality. Some people might be left scratching their heads over the lens's unusual 65mm focal length, which is fair enough, but I personally found it quite interesting and intuitive to shoot with. The lens comes highly recommended.